Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to just settle yourselves and take your seats, uh, I'm asked to remind you that you're in stream B, just in case you're in the wrong room at the right time, uh, and you're meant to be somewhere else. Uh, and this session is Shaping the Energy Future. So, good afternoon, welcome. I'm Louise Kingham. I am uh, in my day job, the Chief Executive of the Energy Institute, which is a professional body and learned society with members based in 100 countries. Uh, and, and particularly uh, a budgeting uh, membership in this part of the world, I'm pleased to say. So I'm delighted to have been invited to be here with you this afternoon, chairing this session, uh, Shaping the Energy Future, How Are Energy Leaders Rising to the Challenges of Delivering Tomorrow's Energy Sustainably? Welcome. Please do come in and take a seat. Just before we get into the, uh, the thrust of the session and I introduce our panel members to, to speak to you, I would just like to confirm to you that there are no planned uh, safety or fire drills this afternoon. Uh, and if there is, then there'll be an announcement over the microphones in the tannoy system and you'll be escorted out by the staff to uh, the, the muster points within the centre. Can I also ask that you, if you've got your mobile phones in your pocket, can you just make sure that they buzz and tingle rather than play nice tunes during the course of the next 45 minutes? Uh, we'd love to hear them, but I don't, I'm hoping our speakers don't need any accompaniment, musical or otherwise, to the things that they want to say to you this afternoon. Now, I'm very conscious that it's after lunch, and I hope you enjoyed lunch. So I thought we... No? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are still going hungry. Well, in that case, I'm going to put you to work, but put you to work gently. There were a, a few questions that were put into a poll. So for those of you that have got iPads, uh, we thought we'd get a little bit of uh, interaction from you first uh, on a couple of questions uh, to see what your sense is, to see how you're feeling on a, on a couple of issues. Uh, and there are, are two of those uh, polls on the iPad. So the first one is a question about whether or not $50 oil is the new normal. And uh, we'd quite like your response to that, please. And then there is a second question on the poll around what, how optimistic you feel about the outcomes of the climate meeting in Paris as to whether or not you think we will be able to get to a two degree deal or uh, maybe three or four. And it'd be quite interesting to have your sense as the audience for our speakers uh, as, to, as to how you feel about that. Right, so there you go. Poll number one, is $50 a barrel the new normal? Yes, no, or not sure? You won't be held to it. There'll be no commercial implications from your opinions as expressed. This is simply uh, to, to get a little bit of interaction with you post-lunch and see how you're feeling. Not quite sure how long it are. Here we go. Right, okay. No, it's not. A resounding no, it's not. Okay. A quarter of you not sure. Oh, that's not quite what we expected. <coughs> Okay, can we try the second poll, please? No, we're struggling. Oh, here we go, right. Paris Climate Change Conference results to global temperature increases being limited to two, three, or four degrees. How do you feel? Hopefully all will be revealed shortly. <laughs> Nobody wants to express a view? Okay. All right. Nobody's voting. We'll try that one, potentially try that one a bit later on if we have time, but I'm conscious of the time, so let's, let's move on. Okay, we have uh, been delighted to be able to welcome our panelists here this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I am going to ask them to speak to you for three or four minutes each, uh, and we're going to whiz along our, our, our list of guest panellists here and hear the things that they've got to say, and then hopefully we will have about 15 or 20 minutes or so for some Q&A. So you can use the event iPads to post your questions, or you can do it the traditional way, pop the hand in the air, and there'll be a roving microphone, and we come to find you during the course of that discussion. But if you can hold on to your questions, scribble them down, uh, either via the iPad or uh, ready for the conversation a little bit later on, I'd be grateful. So we have a lot to try and get through for you this afternoon. 
So, uh, let me introduce our uh, panel to you. I am very pleased to welcome uh, Vincent Schachter, Vice President of R&D from Total New Energies, Dr. Angela Strank, Chief Scientific Advisor from BP, Dr. Mohammed al Saban, former senior advisor to the ministry uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, Ministry of Petroleum, I should say, Mohammed al Mafari, Vice President of HSE from Adnoc Distribution, and Raphael Schundgen, President, Global Research and Technologies and Executive Committee Member of GDF Suez. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Vincent to the stage to kick us off. So thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my uh, privilege to start the session. Therefore, I guess I'll have to give a few words of context. Um, I'll be brief about the global context because I guess you all know it. Rising energy demand in developing countries. That's a very important point, point number one. Then stable or declining demand in Europe and shift towards renewables. Europe is particularly attentive to the climate change agenda. And then there is the rise of con unconventional resources in the US, uh, which is changing the role of the US on the uh, global energy landscape. And finally, there is the rise of renewables, which we're gonna discuss at length. These are uh, four elements that shape, I think, uh, the energy world as we see today in 2014. From the technology viewpoint now, which is uh, the specific focus of this panel, what has been happening in the last few years is very significant. There's a coming of age of renewables, particularly solar. Uh, by coming of age, I mean simply cost reduction and scale. Uh, renewables is becoming a serious business, and it's also mature enough uh, to penetrate uh, many geographies and quickly. This in turn is enabling another phenomenon, distributed power generation, uh, residential or commercial, or even to a certain extent, if you take big solar power plants, you can locate them in various places, it decentralizes the grid a little bit. So it's modifying the structure of the grid. Another way to say this, which I think one of my colleagues is going to elaborate on is, uh, can go to smaller systems with distributed generation. This gives a role to storage. Storage is a key enabler of renewables, both defensive, in a way you'll see people saying that uh, there's increased variability uh, on the grid because of renewables, so you may need storage to mitigate this. This is one view of it. And the flip side of this is that storage, by shifting the time of use, helps you match production and consumption better, supply and demand. And so, or rather, it will help you do that once the cost of storage decreases uh, enough so that storage becomes economical in utility scale systems and in residential systems. It is happening. There is an arms race on storage technology, a very interesting one. And uh, if you can tell me the winner at the pause, I'm interested. Um, Connected objects technologies are enabling demand control. This is another piece of the puzzle, control of consumption. Think residential home and look at the success of one cool connected obje object, the Nest thermostat, which is a consumer electronics angle on this. <laughs> but it is demand control and it is another way to match the supply and demand curve. And then there is aggregation. <coughs> Think residential and think many houses with generation, with PV panels on the roof, uh, and think uh, instead of shifting in time with storage where you consume the energy that your PV panel produces later during the day when you need it, with aggregation you shift in space. So if Mr. Jones has a PV panel on his roof but he's not at home and doesn't need the energy, perhaps Mr. S Mrs. Smith next door uh, needs the energy to hit her swimming pool. That's aggregation, or that's the simplistic view of aggregation. Aggregation can be much more. Now, putting distributed generation, storage, and demand control together, it is a software question. 
How do you manage energy flows from your PV panel to your battery, from the panel to the grid, from various places of the grid to the places where the energy is most needed at that time? So it has become a software challenge, uh, these energy management algorithms. So I would contend in a way that the rise of renewables had made, has made the smart grids rhetoric real. Um, and so this matches a more general trend in the lives of everybody, which is that our lives have become more digital. Um, we are used to information flows in real time being connected. We're used to expecting more of uh, services that are being provided to us at all times because of this connectivity and the digital world that is evolving, uh, well, very quickly, as you all know now. Uh, the customers are expecting the same thing in the energy space, and that again is going to change the landscape. So see technology push, but also the customers expect more. That is the solar value chain. Just a couple of words about another value chain in renewables that uh, we like very much at Total, that's industrial biotechnology. Uh, this again is a field where science and technology have been advancing very, very quickly in the last 20 years. It's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, we're starting to understand how living systems function and we are able to modify them. And therefore we can modify, for instance, yeast to do chemistry for us and produce fuels and chemicals, hopefully at a cost compatible with the respective markets. Uh, it's less mature than solar, obviously, but it's very promising. What do we do at Total in these fields? Uh, so we chose to focus our efforts on those two industrial routes, the solar value chain and the industrial biotechnology value chain, turning biomass into fuels and chemicals. We have a dedicated entity within Total doing that, Total New Energies, uh, and our focus has been on technology differentiation. In solar, we choose to partner with uh, SunPower, which has best-in-class technology in panels. And so we took a uh, majority stake in SunPower in uh, 2011. Back then, by the way, the uh, big reduction in solar costs had not happened yet. It was just before. It was a bet, and uh, we lived through interesting times. Um, SunPower is providing both power plants and residential solutions with a global footprint, uh, 4.5 gigawatts deployed. And uh, it's integrating storage and uh, energy management system now and uh, shifting towards the universe that I described to you earlier on. In biotechnology, we partnered with uh, several startups. Our main partner is Amherst Biotechnology in California, uh, which has an, a so-called synthetic biology platform that develops trains of yeast uh, fast that are able to produce the chemicals we want them to produce. In terms of product, I said biotech was less mature, but it's not completely true. Our first product, a biojet that we can produce from sugar, was certified this year, and uh, a number of planes have flown already with that biojet, including one here exactly a year ago at the same conference. Finally, R&D model, how did we achieve uh, the technology development that is behind all that? Uh, we choose to start our R&D, Total had nothing in renewables five years ago, we, we choose to start our R&D as a network of partnerships between Total on the one hand and startups or academic labs on the other. Uh, we choose them very carefully. We develop technology bricks that we think are needed in the value chain with each partner and we try to connect all these together. So again, it's a network story. And uh, with, uh, without further ado, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here again in Abu Dhabi. BP has a very long history in the UAE, since the 1930s, in fact, when Air BP established a, a business here. There are many aspects to sustainable energy, but today I'm going to focus my brief opening remarks on the challenge of carbon reduction. 
There's quite a number of ways that we can reduce carbon, but I'm going to mention just a few. The first is energy saving, or using energy more efficiently. Currently, only about 12% of primary energy is converted into useful heat, light, and motion, and we need to do better. Another way is energy switching, or shifting energy from higher to lower carbon forms. This can mean switching from coal to gas, and from fossil to non-fossil fuels. In fact, we calculate that switching just 1% of coal used in power plants to gas could reduce emissions by as much as 11%, uh, as much as increasing the global renewable capacity by 11%. The third way is carbon saving, which means using hydrocarbons, but then capturing or recycling the carbon produced. And finally, because these areas are all challenging, they often require energy partnerships to bring together the right resources, technology, and the very best capabilities. <clears throat> Companies like BP are, and have been for some years, making progress in all these areas. In terms of energy saving, transportation is actually a very good example. Automotive manufacturers are creating cleaner, more fuel-efficient engines with technologies such as downsizing, boosting, stop-start, hybridization, batteries, direct injection, to name just a few. And BP, under both our BP and Castrol brands, is developing new lubricants that can increase fuel efficiency by up to 4.5%, significantly reducing tailpipe CO2 produced especially in regions such as Europe, where regulations from the government mandate the standards required. We're also focusing on operational efficiency. Our latest petrochemical plant in Zhuhai in China produces 65% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than our older, more conventional plants. <clears throat> And we're working very closely with partners on sustainable energy projects. For example, here in Abu Dhabi, where we're modeling the future demand and supply of energy and water using a new predictive tool using a call for SEER, which was developed collaboratively between BP and the University of Cambridge in the UK. BP also has a long history of carbon saving. These are projects taking carbon dioxide to produce oil more efficiently through enhanced oil recovery. Looking to energy switching, we're investing in several huge new gas projects around the world. And I'll just talk about three very briefly. We're building the 3,500 kilometer Southern Corridor gas pipeline through seven countries, bringing gas from the Caspian into Europe. We're also producing gas from the massive kazan tight gas formation in Oman to increase the domestic gas supply of that country by one third. And we're delivering gas to China and India as a cleaner alternative to coal. In renewables as well, BP has a material biofuels business in Brazil producing sugarcane ethanol. And we have a significant wind business in the USA. And finally, looking briefly at energy partnerships, many technologies still need support to develop their full potential. And that's why we're working with the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology in a $7 million technology accelerator program to support sustainable technology companies here in Abu Dhabi. BP also has a thriving ventures business, which invests in promising startups both in conventional energy improvements, but also biotech, renewables, smart buildings, energy efficiency, and several other related areas. So finally, as a practical step to sustainability today, the emissions generated by all of us traveling here to this conference this week are being offset through BP's long-standing and not-for-profit carbon management program called Target Neutral. If you would like to find out more about this carbon offsetting or any other of our sustainable projects, please uh, visit us at the BP stand. 
Thank you very much for listening and your attention this afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm not coming from an energy company. I'm basically uh, used to work for the government, so my, my very brief presentation will concentrate on what, what is the government perception in the developing world as far as sustainable energy future. I remember when we start thinking in the Ministry of Petroleum of Saudi Arabia about more than 10 years ago, do we need other sources of energy? We have already oil and gas. And uh, if the uh, requirement is to have clean oil and clean gas, that's fine. We can do a lot of research in that in order to uh, apply the clean fossil fuel technologies, including the carbon sequestration technologies. However, as we moved uh, in the years, we have noticed that our domestic demand for energy has increased tremendously at a rate of 7% uh, annually. And uh, Saudi Arabia is considered to be one of the largest uh, uh, energy produ uh, I mean consumer in the world per capita, of course. And of course, there are many, many factors contributed to that, including the uh, very cheap fuel, fuel, uh, fuel cost, and also uh, the, uh, the large area of Saudi Arabia where you need to, uh, to, to go here and there by using your car. And uh, there is also an absence of the public transportation. Anyway, uh, there was a little change in our roadmap that we thought that we cannot sustain using uh, oil and gas in order to meet our domestic energy demand. And that whatever we are consuming domestically will prevent us from exporting uh, oil and gas to the rest of the world, and that will be translated in a loss of income. So we thought of having renewables, and in particular, solar energies. And now there is uh, a plan that has already been in place. Uh, of course, they have not been implemented yet, but they are talking about 40 gigawatt of solar in order to, uh, by, by 2030, or maybe even before that, in order to uh, provide electricity uh, and desalinating water in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have some, some difficulties uh, in trying to see what kind of relationship between the private sector vis-a-vis -vis the government, especially in the wake of lower oil prices now. Uh, we need to recalculate uh, our uh, our plan in order to reflect a fair price for the uh, new uh, investors in Saudi Arabia. But in general, I think uh, we are movi moving ahead, and uh, not because of the climate change. With all respect, of course, climate change is something that we will uh, consider, but it is for many countries. To be honest with you, for many developing countries, it's way down in the line of priorities. It is basically an economic need and Saudi Arabia is embarking on uh, solar, uh, wind, and some other uh, energy sources, as I said, because of its growing uh, domestic energy demand. So, and, and, to, to, uh, and finally, I think uh, Saudi Arabia will succeed to be diversified. We are thinking of being an energy export, not only uh, oil and gas exporter. Uh, we will be an exporter of energy, including solar, to neighbor, neighboring countries. Of course, this will take a long time, but we are working on achieving and implementing that, and I think this is one way to diversify our economy. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in fact, I was uh, I was given some information earlier about the uh, uh, the session, and um, then I realized that uh, there are uh, experts uh, are going to address some of the things that have been in the, uh, uh, intended for this session. So what I will do is I will first uh, maybe I will first touch on on. Uh, on a, an actual experience of ad hoc distribution. And because I come from a, an operational background, uh, I will talk about the, the outcome. Uh, the respected speakers spoke about research and developments, about uh, uh, philosophies on, on a governmental level or uh, policies that are that their countries or, or organizations, big organizations such as Total or BP, are setting for themselves, uh, but I think there has been enough research and huge effort toward that, and this, this conference is an example of that, toward sustainability. Uh, if I go down to the scale uh, and I put it into our example as an ad hoc distribution, and uh, maybe for the sake of uh, knowledge, uh, ad, -hoc, ad hoc distribution is the arm for ad hoc mother company in the distribution side. So all these the stations, fuel stations that you see in the United Arab Emirates and other services, the uh, fueling for the airports and as well as military services, uh, is, uh, we are in charge of it. So basically we, we don't have lots of competition. In fact, maybe very little competition. So we have to be driven within in implementing sustainable energy. And we have sustainability within the business that we do on a daily basis. And we found out, and although I come from an EMP, you know, I just joined the, the, the distribution <coughs> part two years ago, that we are very good on, uh, you know, finding the problems, identifying what are the potential solutions, uh, whether the technology or procedures or systems and so on. But then we, we lack a lot on the execution side. When we come put things on action, we tend to move very slow. And I am sure you can all relate to that because some of the things that we speak about now, sustainability, are sometimes things that presented 15, 20 years ago, and we still talk about them. There may be some progress, but is it good? Are we satisfied with it? It's something that we need to answer. So in, in the ad hoc distribution side, and just to be practical about, at least I can give a, uh, an actual experience, we, it's a culture. We focused on the culture of sustainability. So we took the elements of, and I think that's what we, many organizations need to be doing, is to find out the, 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 the elements that makes a sustainable, sustainable organization and change the culture toward that. So we need to address the people side, the technology side, and the systems and the procedures that exist, whether it's an organization level or an oil and gas company or any other organization that's in this business of energy. And accordingly, systematically, we measure that. And of course, at the very high top is a system that tells exactly how are we sustainable and what are we going to achieve. And sometimes, we found out in our experience that we moved quickly and created a big cloud or big boom and we choked and we could not move forward as we wanted to move. So it is a journey, continuous, but in achievable measures, achievable targets that you have to do. And uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but that's what drives execution. And eventually you have to be able to measure what you said is what you are actually doing. And you have to be transparent about it. And accordingly, see the outcome and the benefits uh, from eventually a financial side as well, down the road. And I'm sure most of you are experts here who can relate to that in terms of energies or renewable energies or cutting down and emissions and so on. That eventually should translate into you know, a financial benefits. 
Uh, in ad hoc distribution, we started this uh, journey very aggressively soon. I mean, uh, a year and a half, I would say, we, we moved it into an aggressive. Uh, and we, we made sure that we cover those elements and have an organization that, uh, that addresses sustainability and a policy and a procedure that, that says that we are committed. And accordingly, I, you know, we have uh, moved into uh, green stations now. So that's our biggest business is the retail side. And we invested a lot on that. But we, we invested smartly into making sure that what we say is what we do in our day-to-day -day business. Um, I don't, there are obviously, uh, if any, you know, any one of you want to talk, to know more about uh, green stations that we are implementing now, I'm going to be very happy to do so, but, but for the sake of the time, uh, maybe I will stop here, but I will still emphasize is, is what we need to be doing is focus on output. And that's exactly the biggest success and the truth of a sustainable approach. Thank you very much. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, let me just tell you one word about uh, GDF Suez and especially for our friends in the Emirates because we are very active in the region for the past 20 years, but we are you know, minority shareholders in projects, so we don't uh, necessarily seek uh, visibility. Uh, we are a financial partner of Mubadala, and over the 20 past years, we have developed with partners about uh, 30 gigawatts of uh, power plants. We also desalinated a lot of millions of cubic meters of water. And here in the Emirates, we are partners in uh, most of the uh, large uh, power and uh, desalination projects. So uh, being active in 70 countries worldwide, being active in three major businesses, which are gas, uh, power, and energy services, today uh, contributing to this panel was uh, being uh, in charge of research and technologies of the company. The idea was to share a little bit what we see in that uh, direction. One of the major things that we see is that we have the classical chain of energy where you had primary energy, let's say coal or gas you get out of the ground, then being transported, being transformed into power, eventually stored and distributed. Those very large systems are completely impacted by the new technologies. What do you see? You see first uh, technologies that tend to shortcut uh, those natural chain. You get to much smaller system, you are much closer to the customer. A perfect example is when you have directly a conversion from solar energy into electricity at the premises of a person. You have then different technologies that enter the field of energy. You all know them. You have nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, digital. And they are having a major impact. Then you see another kind of technologies, which is also very interesting, which we call system technologies. You may all have heard about power to gas, which is you take renewable energy, you hydrolyze water, you get hydrogen, and with the hydrogen you get mobility, so you have a connection between the world of power and the world of gas. And you may use the other way around power plants or fuel cell to go back from the world of glass, gas to the world of power. So you see, in that world, we are here in an extremely changing environment, and you also see that you have new chains being built up. So as a summary, I would like to share with you five major trends that we see with all these technologies happening. We have already talked about a few of them, but the first one is that we go towards much smaller uh, system, which are very close to the customer, and this both in the gas field with small energy system and the power field, we already mentioned it, many of us. Second, we see in the world a very a much broader interest for all kind of primary energies. And what Dr. Al-Saban just mentioned to us is this interest that we, it's not only about gas, oil, coal, uh, solar, wind, it's also about geothermal, it's also about the hydrogen uh, economy, it's about a full range of different primary energy and technologies that you need to mix together. Third, we see an interesting increase 
of uh, players. And I just came out from another panel on CO2, what to do with CO2 and CO2-related technologies. And not only to put it in the grounds, but also to do something out of it, which is currently difficult and costly, but that is probably promised to a certain future. Fourth, I have also mentioned it, we see this interpenetration between the gas system and the power system. Then we see new valorization chains. I mentioned to you the fact that we move from uh, renewable energy towards hydrogen and towards mobility, but I could quote also, and this has an impact when you see large solar-based energy being transported, we see systems being developed around HVDC, for instance, you know, the highways of power, that change uh, the landscape. And then finally, uh, the last six trends, uh, which is for us major, is the uh, appearance of digital. So what do we do uh, in light of that? With partners everywhere, we tend to build ecosystems, ecosystem around technologies and innovative solutions. This is what we call our GDF Suez Labs. And uh, we have, or historically, those ecosystems are most developed uh, in our countries of origin, which is Europe, but we are developing them now worldwide. And we do pilot projects, I'll just quote a few. Uh, we do about power to gas, and we mix the H2 with uh, methane. We do, uh, for instance, biomass, biogas out of dry biomass. You know, you have wet biomass, it transforms easily into gas, but take a piece of wood or take a piece of straw, and look at it in the eyes, it's not going to turn into gas anytime soon. So you need technologies for that, uh, gasification, that's what we do, 50 million euros we put on that kind of thing. Some speakers talked about aggregation. We have run all kind of different projects across Europe on on demand side response, you have windmills producing power, how can you switch on or switch out boilers in homes in order to adapt? And then uh, I wanted to quote uh, a local project because we had the pleasure uh, yesterday night. Uh, this week is very important for us. We are opening a new GDF Suez lab uh, for the Middle East after these 20 years of presence here in Mazama with in partnership with Mostar Institute of Technologies. And its first uh, work will be uh, research on desalinization of water based on renewable energy, solar energy. And so we have the pleasure to open this this week. And we signed yesterday with the president of Mazda, Mazda Institute of Technologies and colleagues in the presence of the French minister, which is in the region for the preparation of the COP21, uh, uh, several things to develop uh, a pilot. So you see, we, uh, as I had exchanges uh, with Mr. Al-Saban just before, we need to open our ecosystem thing uh, from a global perspective. I, I agree very much with what uh, Mr. al al Fali has said. We need to deliver on what we have said, be driven by sustainability, and work all together on those challenges. Thank you very much. Um, panelists, thank you very much for those contributions. We, we've got a few minutes for uh, question time and uh, just scrolling through some of the questions that you've kindly uh, submitted through on the event iPads, there's a, a, a theme around a couple of them uh, which I wanted to pick up and it's also a discussion point for, for the session around whether or not sustainability can drive higher performance in, uh, in organisations and particularly in oil and gas companies, uh, you're asking this question about whether or not the environmental imperative is at odds with the, uh, the natural business of, of these organisations. So I'm interested to know whether or not there is a view on uh, whether or not sustainability can drive higher performance in the organisations. Angela, do you have a view? Yes. Um, is this on? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Louise. Um, well, the answer is yes, absolutely. It can help drive business performance. Um, the first point I'd make is just listening to these five panellists this afternoon, you've heard about lots of different types of businesses uh, around energy. It's not just about oil and gas, there's bio, we've heard about solar, we've heard about geothermal, we've heard about all sorts of different businesses. So there are lots of opportunities and each company needs to decide which ones it's going to play in. And on the conventional oil and gas side, of course, there is a lot to do around efficiency, as I said in, in my talk uh, earlier on. A um, couple of examples at um, our Toledo refinery in the US, 
um, we've delivered an 8% energy efficiency improvement um, in the last three years. And that will be ongoing, and you can replicate that uh, to other refineries around the world. Um, so there are, there are lots of opportunities. So that will obviously reduce our costs and uh, make our plants more efficient. The, um, I think growing revenue as well through new products around the sustainability agenda, uh, new lubricants, new fuels for new types of vehicles, um, new services. There's um, all sorts of opportunities around this agenda and it's a very, very exciting business to be in wherever you choose to play. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that one, Vincent? You're on. So I would also answer, yes, definitely it can drive higher performance in... Uh, Actually, there are several ways to look at the word performance here. So first of all, in renewable energy production itself, in the businesses we choose to in, in get involved in, whether it's solar or biotech, we're looking for performance. And if you just look at the cost of solar those last three years, uh, the uh, higher performance is obvious. Um, biotech now, in a different sense, um, since it's unclear that uh, customers are ready to pay that much for a bio premium when it comes to uh, fuels and chemicals, uh, what they are ready to pay for, though, is a higher performance of those products themselves. Mm -hmm. They're ready to pay for better fuels. They're ready to pay for chemicals with different properties. And in that sense, we're very much targeting higher performance of products. Um, a third sense is that take renewable energy production, marry it with uh, more traditional energy, hybrid systems. That's higher performance. It requires also uh, dimensioning and funding those projects so that they uh, find their business niche. So that's higher performance. And the last one is take our more traditional activities. If you want to be sustainable, surely uh, how you design your plans, how you design the logistics, how you design the products uh, has to be thought through very carefully and that's also higher performance. That, that relates to another question that's come in for you. Uh, Mohammed. The, uh, the question here is, does, uh, do you think that greener fuels, biofuels are going to gain popularity within the UAE? Biofuels are going to gather uh, interest, enthusiasm and, and use in the UAE? Again, I, uh, if you uh, look at the um, traditional way of uh, energy around here, fuels, uh, the question is, we relate to performance as well as efficiency. And if we are able to identify or confirm our, you know, the, the performance side mm -hmm. and the efficiency side, definitely the alternatives, wherever they are, they will come in because it's, a, it's a, a logic way of moving into a much more efficient way of producing energy or utilizing energy. So, generally speaking, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, we definitely need to do th that if, if we are looking at, uh, uh, at uh, conserving the energy, as uh, protecting the environment, and be much more efficient. And those are the, you know, the fundamentals of sustainability, as well as you know, the social, the, this responsibility mm. of the organizations toward, toward, the, toward the, the, the environment. Okay. So I, I, I agree, yes. Raphael, there's also another question. I know you want to come in on that point, but there's another question for you, so you can answer both of these as we're, we're running short of time. Uh, do you believe that solar power desalination could be used in the region? Uh, and if so, would it be cost on a basis of being cost effective? As regard cost, I will not uh, develop on it. Uh, is it's, can it be developed in the region? Definitely. Uh, we have seen here a strong uh, push uh, from the local uh, stakeholders to go in that direction with uh, different pilot projects, uh, research being done on it. Uh, the best technologies, available technologies, are being pulled uh, into those projects. And what R&D is doing is looking at, on a constant basis, on how to enhance that, how to make it work even better, because there is a future for those kind of plays. Uh, and of course, by doing that research is also with a view to make it competitive, to make it uh, financially uh, viable. So the answer on the first part is definitely yes, and the answer on the second part is to be further assessed and 
that's one of the elements that R&D is there for, is how to think wisely in terms to lower cost. If time allows, I would be happy to comment on the previous questions you mentioned regarding sustainability, but I want to take too much of the floor. Yeah, time, time won't allow, I'm afraid, but maybe we can pick that up as, uh, as, we, as we leave the session. Are there any other questions? I rattled through the ones that you've kindly put through on the iPad. Is there anything else as a, as a final question uh, to our panel that anybody wished to, to raise? Gentlemen, there's a just gentleman in the middle there to, towards the back. Can you just say who you are, sir, and, and whether or not your question is directed at any particular panelist, please? Yes, it's more of a comment than a question. Okay. My name is uh, Howard Hornfeld. I'm from the group Fusion Advocates in Geneva. And I have not heard at all during this discussion the possibility of using fusion energy. We've talked about every, every other kind of energy, but fusion energy is going to happen. Within the next 10 years, we intend to build a pilot plant to show that net electricity can be generated from fusion energy. If anybody wants to talk to me about it later on, I'd be happy to talk about it to anyone who's interested. Okay, thank so thank you very much for that comment. I guess one of the options might be to have you up on the panel next year to tell everybody uh, about, that, about that one. I'm sure people would be delighted to hear. So I'm very sorry. We are literally 27 seconds to go before I, we time out. There is a, a, a session that's coming in here on energy efficiency opportunity to follow. So uh, first of all, I'd be um, very grateful to you if you would show your appreciation to the panel in the normal way, please. Thank you very much. Thanks to, thanks to all of you uh, for your, your comments and contributions. I think you've heard a, a number of very uh, insightful uh, remarks today during this session around a more systematic approach to uh, developing energy systems that will help energy companies to innovate and to invest. Uh, I think that's been important because there's no single solution to delivering energy sustainably. I think you've heard that as a, a cross-section of commentary from today's panel. Energy companies will clearly do what makes good business sense, and I, and I think, again, the panellists were very clear on that point, and also in working through collaboration uh, and partnerships and being responsive to societal change, whether that's the digital age or whether that's the rise of the consumer and, and their role in the energy system going forward. Uh, but there is no doubt, if you get your business model right, sustainability can drive higher performance. So on that note, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thank you very much for taking part in this session. Thank you.